Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the web lecture series organized by the Department of English in collaboration with IQC Internal Quality Assurance Cell of Ulveria College. It's a great pleasure that you are taking part in each and every lecture in a great number, and you are giving feedback constantly to make it successful. So it's a great honor and privilege also that uh, we have with us today Professor Dr. Sandeep Ain, Head Department of English from Bakura University. He will deliver a special lecture, enlightening lecture on Blackwood Magazine, Digital Humanities and Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. So on behalf of the Department of English and on behalf of IQAC, uh, I heartily welcome you, sir, to today's session. Yeah, thank you, Sundeep. And, and this is, and this text is included uh, very much in the CBCS syllabus. I think uh, all the students are waiting to listen to this lecture. So uh, before uh, the lecture, I would like to request uh, the Bolina Babutta, Faculty Department of English, to introduce our guest of honor to today's session. Thank you so very much, uh, sir. Uh, Professor Shondi Kumar Dolui, Head of the Department, Department of English, Shuruvenia College, for giving me this opportunity to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Shondi Pine, sir. Before introducing him, I would like to express something, sir. I am very much thankful and indebted to you, sir, uh, because while I was uh, pursuing my MPhil, uh, Dr. Pinaki, uh, Pinaki Day, sir, who is uh, Assistant Professor of uh, Piari Mohan College, he time and again referred to your name uh, and uh, your book that has been uh, referred to mentioned in the uh, uh, bio note that you have provided us with. Uh, that helped a lot that you have edited uh, because my area was also Amitabh Bhosh's uh, area of research was also on the Bush's satellites and uh, that formed my sensibility and it was a real really really uh, a great help for me so I'm very much indebted and I'm very much thankful to you sir and uh, the Department of English of Ulubedia College welcomes you once again uh, so let me this is uh, an immense pleasure and I feel myself elated to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Shondip Ayn who is an uh, eminent uh, professor of English from uh, Bakura University. Uh, he has edited Amitabh Ghosh's The Shadow Lines, a critical anthology published by Worldview Publishing House in the year 2011. He has been awarded PhD in the year 2011 by Jadupur University, Kolkata. The area of his research interest includes post-colonial literary theory and Indian English literature. He has published widely in national and international journals and has presented papers in a number of national seminars and conferences. He has also acted um, as reviewer for international peer-reviewed journals. And today he is going to uh, deliver his lecture on Blackwoods Magazine, Digital Humanities and the study of Conrad's uh, Heart of Darkness. So, so uh, the students of our department, they are eagerly waiting to listen to you, sir, uh, because being teachers and being learners as well, we can only provide them with the keys so that uh, they can just open up and interpret and reinterpret the texts and we can uh, just, I'm just requesting you to help them to broaden their horizontal boundary. So, sir, it's, it's uh, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Devolina, for the kind introduction. Uh, Pinaki has, is a very dear friend of mine and he continuously, I also continuously refer to him. Uh, he helps me a lot. And thank you also for Ulubiriya College and Shondi especially for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to speak here. I mean, it's always good to reach out to the students and to talk about new things. So what I will do in this paper is to uh, discuss Conrad's Heart of Darkness from a very different perspective, from a very different point of view, that is digital humanities. Hmm. I would like to share the screen with you. So, should I begin my lecture? Uh, sh should I begin my lecture, right? Thank you. Okay, I'll just share my screen and then I'll begin my lecture. 
One moment, please. I hope you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Hello? So, no, sir, it, it's not visible, sir. It's not visible. One minute. Okay, let me just do it. Yes, again. yes. Yeah, it was visible, right? Yes, 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 sir. So now, is it visible? Shondeep, it is visible now? Uh, we can see, sir. Uh, it's it's visible, sir. Okay, no this is a part. Yes, okay, see. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So the title of my paper is Blackwood Magazine, Digital Humanities and the Study of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Uh, historically, humanities and specifically literary studies engaged itself with limited data. That is to say, it confined itself to analysis of an epic, novel, poem, etc. The amount of data available to a literary scholars was also limited. One needed to go to the library that was physically and geographically accessible to him in order to study the available material related to his interests. The Library of Alexandria could hold tens and thousands of scrolls. In the 1990s, the World Wide Web with its hyperlink, hypertextual documents with searchable and viewable browsers is a recent phenomena, keeping in mind humanities, literary and diverse. The Sumerian tablets in which the first known epic was discovered has in a sense returned in the form of digital tablets. The difference being that this digital technologies can store huge amount of data and has huge accessibility. Because of the tremendous amount of, because of the tremendous amount of cultural data, Because of the tremendous amount of cultural data that human beings consume and produce, it has now become difficult and in fact impossible to stay away from computational strategies that will sort the stru and structure this data. Google now indexes more than a trillion web pages and has scanned and cataloged more than 14 million books. Gesto, another important Academic database contains more than 7 million articles from more than a thousand publishers. Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, and such other applications produces so much cultural material every day that it is difficult to categorize, classify, archive, or store such data in any meaningful way. The limited data that a literary scholar has to grapple with is no longer tenable in the modern world. Humanities now have to deal with large data sets, engage in a much broader corpus of study. The corpus of text in the study from time immemorial dependent, is dependent on the medium of recording data, papyrus, stone and clay tablets, print technologies, and now digital technologies. As we advance, the storage, ritual, processing, and distribution of information expands. So much so that if I am to access the manuscript of Heart of Darkness or the serialized script in Blackwood's magazine, I need not go to a physical library in the United States or in the United Kingdom, but can access it from any place with the help of the internet. The advances of the digital medium has made the data available to an unimaginable readership. The availability of large data sets have also expanded the horizon of humanities. Traditionally, in the sciences, large data sets leads to better, verifiable conclusions. 
In humanity studies, this large data set is expected to broaden our scope of learning. It meant that we critically evaluate and extract meaning from close reading of texts. Creativity and interpretation was often carried out in moments and places of seclusion. The visual culture of digital medium requires collaboration. For example, a computer expert is required to collaborate with a literary scholar in order to properly comprehend this enormous data sets. Such collaboration exists, for example, in the making of a film or other forms of transmedia storytelling. Even oral culture, which predates print technology, relied on such collaborative endeavors. The digital culture does not necessarily replace the hermeneutic tradition, but rather reinforces it by making us look at it. By making us look Sorry. at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir, may I interrupt you once? Yes, please. Sir, sir can you please uh, click on the hide button showing in the bottom of your screen? Oh, oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. One sir, minute. It is obstruction in the presentation, actually. Okay. Uh, right, this is now okay, right? Yeah, it is absolutely fine, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. The digital culture does not necessarily replace the harmonic tradition, but rather it reinforces it by making us look at it from both the macro and the micro level. On the one hand, it enables us to search for large scale patterns and also helps us to focus on narrow perspectives for a fine grained analysis. It creates both a synergistic possibility and tension between deep analysis and distant analysis. Print is no longer the primary medium by which knowledge is now disseminated. In spite of the fact that it still remains a very important medium, it has been superseded by digital mediums, which has expanded our traditional concepts of knowledge in humanities, social sciences, and the sciences. The, this proliferation of digital technologies has led to the need of rethinking and remapping of traditional ways of learning. The digital tools and techniques now allow humanists to formulate new questions. It enables us to ask questions that can comprise the involvement of enormous data sets. Some examples of such questions are how African slaves from different cultures settled in America or the visualization of pyramids that now no longer exist. How we can interpret 500 books at once, how to engage machines to translate books from one language to the other. Digital humanities has sought to expand the span of human knowledge. It takes within its corpus the human history from prehistory to the present. There are also other branches, there are also other branches, sorry, there are also other branches of digital mediums affecting the way literature is created, such as digital literature involving interactive storytelling, computer assisted writing. So, digital literature is not just about the digitization of older printed books, manuscripts, or creation of ebooks. Rather, there are a lot of active and interactive ways of engaging with it. A computer, for example, way back in 1952, was programmed by Christopher Strachey to generate love letters, one per every minute. And it would go on doing this for hours without, <coughs> excuse me, without producing a duplicate. It was often considered to be the first work of electronic literature. This computer was affectionately known as the MUC, meaning Manchester University Computer. Two sentence formats were provided. My, then adjective, then noun, then adverb, then verb, then your, then adjective, and then now. And the other sentence was, you are my, within quotes, and then adjective noun. 
the computer would randomly select the nouns, adjectives, and adverbs from the selected words provided by Strachey from the thesaurus. There are debates among critics. You can see the two samples of love letters uh, in this slide. There are debates among critics as to how to read these letters. One form in which it is read is as a parody of love letters. And often another form in which it is situated is that there could be a queer interpretation given Strachey's sexual orientation. Strachey was thought to be gay. Another example would suggest that even creative literature has taken a new form with the digital book. Another example of such a change can be evinced in uh, there is a website called lifemargin.com, for example. It is an online platform which allows writers to share different stages or drafts of their writing. Readers then can add notes and comments on the margin. By doing so, it creates a chain of conversation between the writer and the reader. The margin in such cases becomes an important, as important as the center of the text. Creating a unique interactive experience. What digital humanities have done is to challenge the primacy of the printed text and move towards a more collaborative and participatory digital medium. The history of digital humanities can be traced back to the work of the Jesuit scholar Roberto Busa, who worked in collaboration with IBM and undertook the creation of an automated approach to his vast Index Thomisticus, a computer-generated accordance concordance to the writings of Thomas Aquinas. To enable such a vast corpus of texts to be searchable, countable, listable by the use of mainframe computer was unthinkable in terms of handwritten index cards. Digital humanities have since then moved on considerably. Since the 1980s, there has been significant development in the field of digital humanities with advancement in computational methods, specifically after the development of the text encoding initiative, TEI. Extensive digital editing was carried out in extensible markup language, XML, of which TEI is a specialized subject. Contemporary digital humanities is thus based on advanced statistical processing, hypertext, data modeling, visualization, and digital structure. Now, I have provided just a broad overview of the advancement of the new branch of study called digital humanities and to serve as an example as to how we might apply such techniques to both close and distinct reading of Conrad's Heart of Darkness. So basically, what we would anal analyze here is, uh, for example, we have also suffered from colonialism. Right? Then why are we reading a text as controversial as Conrad's Heart of Darkness? The My analysis would be made in two parts. First, I'll focus on how simple digitization of text and building of digital archive have tremendously helped us in the study of literature. As I have mentioned, I as I have mentioned earlier, the texts after the digitization have been made accessible to wide readership. Project Gutenberg, for example, has made available a huge number of ebooks that could be read in any platform, including mobile devices. including mobile devices, we need not go to a physical library or buy a book in order to have access to it, which has led to a great democratization of learning. Uh, many of our postgraduate and graduate students, for example, were able to compare, complete their projects, dissertations, even in this time of Corona, with access only to their mobiles, because all those materials were available digitally to them. Most of them had only access to internet resources to complete their work. This proves how digitization of resources have led to democratization of learning. 
Similarly, almost the entire works of Conrad has been digitized. Conrad's Heart of Darkness is a severely complex text which is obsessed with the limits of narration and the difficulty of articulation. Besides the narrative complexity, another most important issue in the Heart of Darkness is the theme of imperialism, as is depicted in the Heart of Darkness and Conrad's role in it or Conrad's position in it. There has been a great critical debate and contention with regard to the representation of imperialism in the text and the responsibility of the author, for example, Conrad. From F. L. Lewis to Chinua Achibe and Edward Said, uh, T. S. Eliot, uh, Ford Maddox Ford, and many other important critics have time and again engaged with this text. Some have denounced it and some have praised it. F. L. Lewis, for example, in his book had focused on Conrad's, I quote, adjectival insistence upon the inexpressible and incomprehensible mystery and commented that Conrad is again I quote intent on making a virtue out of not knowing what he means. Achibe on the other hand had accused Conrad of being a thorough going racist. This critical there are other important debates as well in this regard. For example, Ford Maddox Ford, uh, he predicted that uh, when imperialism would go away, although it hasn't gone away, but if imperialism would go away, a Conrad's Heart of Darkness would be a masterpiece just because of its poetry, just because the way it narrates it. E.S. Eliot uh, read this work as a work about evil, hopelessness, and moral emptiness, and we are aware of its influence. Uh, we are aware of its influence in the poem on his poem, The Westland. Uh, Ezra Pound had actually suggested why he wanted to use the term horror, horror, but Ezra, Ezra Pound, while editing the work, had suggested that he remove this line. Andre Jid, uh, one of the very important French novelists, felt that he actually read this book four times and once he was going to a journey in Congo, the picture in this uh, slide would show you a picture of Andrejit sitting in one of the rooms when he was traveling to Congo. And he says that this admirable book remains profoundly true. There is no exaggeration in his picture. It is cruelly exact. Uh, again, when we read even Graham Ginn's The Art of the Matter, even in the title, we find that there is an affinity with Heart of Darkness. Green wrote in 1959 from West Africa that much had not changed. Again, Green also visited Congo and he said that uh, much had not changed since Conrad's day. So, when we read all the tremendous critical debates, that, that some say that uh, Conrad's Heart of Darkness is an extremely racist text and we should not read it at all. Some say that it deserves attention because of the poetry and the way it has been narrated and the way uh, Conrad had masterfully. Uh, laid down in terms of language. So there is a lot of critical debate with Heart of Darkness and therefore it makes interpretation of Heart of Darkness quite difficult, especially uh, Conrad's ideas about imperialism and colonialism. This critical debate and the narrative complexity of the Heart of Darkness has given the novella a long afterlife. It is reread and read from myriad perspectives. Moreover, with the availability of critical material digitally, the afterlife of many of Conrad's works have retained great importance even today. Its importance can be found in the different type of digital adaptations it underwent, that is, from films to computer games. I would also like to talk about the digitization of certain resources, which has immensely helped in our understanding of Heart of Darkness, the digitization of the Blackwood's Edinburgh magazine, which is now accessible to anyone who is able to surf the internet and provides us with the dis distant critical overview that I was talking about in the introduction. If we would have just focused on critical works on Conrad and not on the politics of the magazine, 
in which it was published, it will not be possible to come to a clearer understanding of the perplexity of Conrad's portrayal of colonialism and imperialism. The Heart of Darkness was serialized in the February, March and April 1899 issues of the Blackwood magazine. Conrad wrote a letter to William Blackwood suggesting that the story is of a time, that it is concerned with contemporary issues of his time. The story is not in general a denouncement of colonialism and imperialism, but rather specifically a critic of King Leopold's colonial projects in the heart of Africa. Act, there was a great critical debate during Conrad's time. Uh, you would understand that uh, Conrad was severely criticizing uh, King Leopold's Belgium, the Belgian king, uh, his projects, his colonial projects, because King Leopold uh, pretended, pretended that he was doing a great service to Africa. He pretended that he was carrying out civilizing mission. So that was what created a lot of problem. Uh, there was a great critical debate during Conrad's time with regard to good and bad imperialism and Leopold's treatment of Africa. The several critical editions of Heart of Darkness containing elaborate criticism, often containing detailed account of historical perspectives, the setting, the background for the story, have each set up the reader to different interpretations of the text. There have been different interpretations and the different critics and each of them actually had guided the reader to interpret Heart of Darkness in very different ways. So let us talk about this Blackwood magazine and why is it so important in understanding Conrad's view of imperialism. Blackwood's magazine was very prestigious and had an unique identity of its own during Conrad's time. And Conrad wanted to publish his works in this magazine. He in fact studied about the Blackwood magazine and consulted Margaret Oliphant's 1897 Annals of a Publishing House, William Blackwood and his sons. It was often referred to as Maga and had its own distinct personality and character which was almost 80 years old during Conrad's time. The overall character of the magazine was so influential that on the one hand, it could have made Conrad to conform to its character. On the other hand, it would create a sort of interpretational space for its readers. This magazine was very popular during that time and it had dictated the test of a lot of the readers as well as the author. So it is quite possible that this magazine would have influenced Conrad's ideas and views as well. The readers were supposed to take this magazine as a, cohes as a cohesive unity with a particular character. Conrad's Heart of Darkness would have been no exception as it existed within this particular interpretive field. And to understand the idea of imperialism, one must also acknowledge this larger circle of interpretation. The Blackfoot's magazine started in 1817 as a Tory organ in opposition to the Vic Edinburgh Review. There were two parties during that time in England, the Tories and the Vicks, and they had radically opposite views. Since its inception, it quickly became reputed for its virulent attacks against John Kitts, William Hazlitt, and Leigh Hunt. Over time, however, it sobered itself and became very popular with its nickname MAGA. During Conrad's time, the two magazines that were extremely popular was the Blackwood and the Harper's. Blackwood catered to what we call a wealthy elite group of British readers whose politics Blackwood represented. Conrad's Heart of Darkness occupied an important place with the publisher as it was published in the celebrated Thousand edition. Conrad's next novel, Lord Jim, was serialized later in the same year. A lot of the readers whose politics the Blackwood magazine represented were involved in the imperial ventures. The question that arises is, how could then Conrad's Heart of Darkness 
which seems to be a critic of imperialism, be published in the Blackwood magazine without seriously hurting the sentiments of the people they were intended for. Both the novels, Heart of Darkness and Lord Jim, seemed radical for its time. Most of the critical commentary before Achieve's critic regarding Heart of Darkness has largely pointed out that Heart of Darkness is an anti-imperialist novel. Many critics have found that in spite of the racism that seems inherent in the novel, Conrad's anti-imperial attitude seems to be out of grain. Uh, in fact, if you look at the biographical details of Joseph Conrad, we would know that uh, Conrad was uh, Polish and his father and mother, uh, as well as his uncle, they all worked for the independence of Poland from Spain. So, in a sense, Conrad's position is very curious. On the one hand, he is the victim. On the other hand, he is on the one hand the colonized and on the other hand the colonizer. And when Conrad goes away to France and then learns the French language, walks in a steamship there, uh, gets into trouble and then escapes to England. And so, in a sense, Conrad's politics itself and Conrad's biographical details itself points out that the Conrad is in is a person who is seeing both sides of the thing. Uh, on the one hand, uh, his own uh, country suffering uh, from colonialism of Russia, and on the other hand, England carrying out its colonial activity. So, as a creature of his time, Conrad could not, well, in a sense, um, as a creature of his time, Conrad could not run their natives their freedom, despite a severe critic of imperialism. That enslaved them. The text, therefore, according to many critics, is very much of its time, and that we are supposed to read the text because it still challenged the discourses of the time. Uh, the description, say, for example, the, the description that we find in the narrative in different parts of the text, the description of the frantic blacks attacking Marlowe's steamship, whites firing back, Kurtz's black mistress, are all elements of an exotic romance and adventure that the readers of this magazine were looking for. His own experience of the Congo, merged with tales of colonial adventures related by travelers of Africa, such as those of Livingstone, Mango Park, Bruce, Burton, and so on, and Conrad's, and we have also an evidence of Conrad's diary from primarily from 13 June uh, to the third, uh, 1st August uh, during that time. 1880s provides such details of journey up to the Congo River. The Congo that Conrad fictionalized is not often of the similar timeline as the Congo in the diary because there are a lot of details in the diary that he had written that he had omitted from his novel. So it seems that there is a difference in the terms of time space between what is written in the diary and the way he depicted Congo in his novel. Conrad expressed hatred in that diary. Conrad expressed his hatred towards Belgian colonialism, but praised the efforts of missionaries. He appreciated the works of missionaries and hated the philanthropic pretends eh, of the colonial administrators and particularly the claims made by Leopold. From his letters to his uncle Broboski, it can be sensed that Conrad had a deep resentment towards the Belgium colonial enterprise. So, what we see is that Conrad is in a sense uh, distinguishing between the two types of imperialism, one good imperialism that was carried out by uh, the English and one bad imperialism uh, which was carried out by the French or the Belgian enterprises. The Tory politics to which, sorry, uh, it will be this only. the Tory politics to which the Blackwood magazine subscribed to in Conrad's time was in favor of imperialism. Conrad's novel couldn't have contradicted the sensitivity of these readers, otherwise Conrad's career as an author would have been jeopardized. The critic of imperialism that Conrad embeds in the novel, therefore, was, wasn't contrary to the literary taste of the readers. It was not something against the grain or any subversive view that Conrad was engaging with. Blackwoods also didn't have any reputation of supporting the avant-garde. 
Conrad was already a familiar name with the Blackwoods as he has already published two previous stories and would also continue to publish Lord Jim. We can deduce, therefore, that the magazine politics was in similar direction to that of Conrad with regard to the politics of imperialism. If one would read the articles of earlier issues, the politics that was obvious was that imperialism is a very dangerous business and that Britain is best suited for it. Others, especially the French and the Spanish, could not traverse this fine line and has reduced it to slavery or rapacity. They have carefully developed the ideology of the civilizing mission and that they are the fittest emissaries. Even the Romans who had conquered England were not good enough, as we find in the beginning of the novel. In the beginning of the novel, the narrator says, But this chaps, I quote, but this chaps were not much account, really. They were no colonists. Their administration was merely a squeeze and nothing more, I suspect. They were conquerors, and for that you want only brute force, nothing to boast of when you have it, since your strength is just an accident arising from the weakness of others. They grabbed what they could get for the sake of what was to be got. It was just robbery with violence, aggravated murder on a great scale, and men going at it blind. As is very proper for those who tackle darkness, the conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter nose than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. So what makes the British better suited than the others? We can decipher that in the following lines. What redeems it? is the idea only, an idea at the back of it, not a sentimental pretense, but an idea, and an unselfish belief in the idea, something you can set up and bow down before and offer a sacrifice to. Kipling's The White Man's Burden, which was composed in 1897 in order to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria, was published just before Conrad's novel. And it goes the same idea primarily. These people were intent to continue. Uh, you can see the uh, poem, a portion of the poem. Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile. To serve your captives need. To wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild. Your new court sullen peoples, half devil and half child. So you can see that. These people were intent to continue with the business of the empire, not only from the commercial gains, but also because of the ensuing glory. The glory of the enterprise had superseded the logic of commerce. In the opening pages of the novel, Marlo the narrator, a Buddha-like figure, whose wisdom we need to trust, seems to equivocally harp on the glory of this imperialism in a narrative that is absolutely postmodern in its uncertainty. What distinguished the British from the Romans, as Conrad would have it, I quote, what saves us is efficiency, the devotion to efficiency. Quote close. The novel goes on to distinguish between efficiency and sentimental pretense. Unlike Marlowe, Kurtz also, uh, Kurtz although being an extraordinary figure whose virtues have been gradually unfolded to the reader, has now fallen for sentimental pretense. Kurtz represents the lost promise, the painful regression from efficiency to sentimentality, so much so that he has become what the British fears the most, the atavism, that he has gone native. He has become a native king, almost as the Africans bow down, and as the Africans bow down to him and offer sacrifices, this is the dangerous turn that imperialism can take. The fear of darkness inhabits the rationality of the self, as it did in the case of Kurds. And only people like Marlowe are able to keep their sanity intact. Even the description of the company offices as being located in the city 
that seemed like a whited sepulchre suggests that Conrad was making a distinction between the British Empire from other colonial empires. That is what the readers were intended to read in the text. How other forms of empires were to be contrasted from the British variety. Homi Baba in 1994, Hunt Hawkins in 1979 and 1992 had made some similar critical conjectures. It is clear, therefore, that Conrad was not going against the ideology of the Blackwood magazine, but rather conforming with it in privileging the British Empire against other continental empires. The large map of Africa that Marlowe sees also points to a similar interpretation. There was a vast amount of red, good to see at any time, because one knows that some real work is done in there. A deuce of a lot of blue, a little green, smears of orange, and on the east coast, a purple patch to show where the jolly pioneers of progress drink the jolly later beer. However, I wasn't going into any of this. I was going into the yellow, dead in the center, and the river was there, fascinating, deadly like a snake. Oh. The red that Marlowe sees is the contour of the British Empire. The yellow represents King Leopold's Africa. Marlowe's preference for British imperialism is clearly indicative in the above speech. Most of the readers would have identified the imperialism of Belgium as similar to that of France, since they have the French language in common. In a sense, therefore, Conrad's novel would have been popular to contemporary readers because it was an oblique critic of French imperialism. It was also important for Conrad as well because Conrad had got into trouble when he was working for the French merchant navy. In fact, French was his second language, English was his third, and in spite of that, he chose to carry out his literary endeavors in the third language. His choice of Marlowe as a narrator is also a claim to that English identity, as was his interest in publishing with the Blackfoots. If one carefully observes the other articles in the February issue of the magazine, there are other instances where the confrontation and rivalry with France are explicitly mentioned. I give examples of those other articles. For example, the sword of Corporal Lacoste is contemptuous of the French Imperial Army and the article elaborates on how the imperial ambition of the British in Madagascar had suffered because of them. A letter, another, a letter from Salamanca also narrated incidences from the wars between Britain and Napoleon's army in Spain. So we find that there are repeated skirmishes between the British and the French. And obviously Conrad was for the British. There are similar other references to French imperialism in March and other editions as well as those that subsequently followed. In 1899, the relationship between France and England were very low as they were engaged in a war. In the text, there are also repeated oblique references to France. Marlowe, for example, travelled in the French steamer. He talks about too many French posts in Africa and comments, for example, I quote, Settlements some centuries old and still no longer than pinheads on the untouched expanse of the background. So we can see that the availability of resources have greatly helped in our understanding the meaning of the text. So we can see that if we interpret in light, interpret Heart of Darkness in light of the Blackwood magazine, so we would be able to more clearly understand what Conrad's politics were and why Conrad was writing for his Blackwood magazine and why it was serialized and why it was so important for the Blackwood magazine as well. So what Conrad was doing was trying to distinguish between good and bad imperialism and Conrad was trying to criticize Belgium imperialism uh, and uh, linking it to French imperialism as well. So this is one part of what I had just, this is one part of digital humanities that I have been talking about, the digitization of the text and how it helps us to understand, understand Conrad's text better. In even the old classical text. Now I go to the other part of my paper, which is 
digital humanities is not just about digitization of old resources right and preserving them but it also involves the use of various computational tools and by applying them to that this is the difficult part of it because it is very new it has very different type of mechanisms it requires software to understand it requires uh, other materials as well and it deals with a huge corpus so in a sense what digital health humanities uh, does to us is to formulate new research questions as well as move to a newer understanding of the text digitization of resources have also led to a different curated editions of text there are a lot of electronic versions of classical text that engage the reader in various ways such as people can engage in annotating electronic text and provide new information about the text so that this electronic text could be molded and preserved through continuous engagement the computational tools with regard to humanities are continuously evolving in fact the advancement of this tool in a reciprocal manner has resulted from the endeavor of humanities studies to engage with it and humanities have adapted to these digital methods and have progressed with it the best part of digital humanities is that its approach has become multidimensional that is one type of skill set is not sufficient to pursue digital humanities now one branch of study is you would all know that if, for example film requires an understanding of very requires uh, demands a lot of skill sets the demands of computational tools have opened up the scope of humanity studies it is no longer the isolated domain of a textual scholar rather it asks for collaboration between coders software engineers graphic artists data experts and the literary scholar to name a few because of the collaborative nature of the work large projects have been carried out with ease digital humanities also has an inclination towards open source and therefore knowledge is disseminated more widely in this paper i would like to focus on how a textual scholar can provide new insights into his reading with the help of computational tools such as network textual analysis in the study of literary text for example you can make a network textual analysis of all of conrad's text or of all the contemporary writers who were writing during the during conrad's time and what the type of words that they were using their preference their structure and you, you can make an analysis of it which would rather become impossible if we are to read each of these lines and to make an analysis it would require a lifetime to do that but there are a lot of devices that would do it for us text network analysis traces the relationship between words group of words characters relationship etc and present a visual analysis in terms of graphs and other graphic images which is quite different from manual stylistic analysis of a text one can use free open source, source software such as voyeur tools and cytoscape to analyze the words such tools enable us to visualize and understand the sentence structure that conrad used the relationship and connectedness between characters the phrases that are linked to each other other stylistic devices and so on the text net network approach i quote displays specific chains or links among words and groups of words in a way that traditional frequency based content analysis and stylistics cannot and allows not just the representation of this relationship but also the qualification along such dimension as strength connectedness and distance you would understand this if you actually my i do not have that amount of time so i have a meeting after this so you would understand uh this type of analysis and the huge scope of this type of analysis because for example you would find websites of digital humanities projects uh, if you search for them for example they have absolutely from the details and the materials available to them they had uh, almost visually recreated the pyramid they have visually recreated paintings and while if you are studying literature what they can do is read enormous data sets for example read complete works of conrad four manners for or the other contemporaries and try to understand the type of words that conrad might have used which would rather be impossible if you had to look just on the text that we study so it takes in huge purpose of study 
the text in literary criticism is explained from the perspective they just if you see this slide you understand that the total corpus total number of words in heart of darkness is 38791 that's what the machine says and that he creates around 5463 unique word forms that is and that suggests the richness of the language that he uses right the text in literary criticism is explained from the perspective of the background con context general language use but not the context of interconnectedness between words so what we do is when we make uh, just uh, do a literary criticism uh, then what we do is we just read the text and try to interpret it from the background the context and the general language but what we do not do is make such big linguistic analysis of the interconnection between the type of words i if you for example see the diagram here and you understand what were the major words that we find and so you see that uh, the type of words that have been repeated in heart of darkness is for example said has been repeated 132 times like and you would understand the connectedness of this words through the such diagrams detailed statistical use of language may sometimes point out to a direction that a conventional literary training might let us overlook it is not that computers are interpreting for us rather it is the readers or the critics who decides they have uh, for example uh, you would if you read conrad and if you read conrad's text in relation to other texts for example i would just give two examples a uh, henry morton stanley's work for example through the dark continent that was published in 1878 very close to conrad's heart of darkness or the other uh, stanley's other Uh, writing in darkest africa it was published in 1890 and if you compare this or for example if you read texts like dickens's tale of two cities julie verne's voyage on the center de la terra or stevenson's the strange case of dr jekyll and hyde all written around this period h g wells's the time machine or for example bram stoker's the dracula conan conan doyle's the hound of the waxer felis what we find is that there are similar lexical allusions in those texts as in conrad the similar type of so which helps us in interpreting conrad in light of all the other texts that were written during that time yeah, so such descriptions so conrad's descriptions you can match them up with the other descriptions you find in this text so it is not the computer who is interpreting for you it is the critics who decides which words or phrases to look at and how to interpret this relationships the interconnectedness between say for example the words such as curds the curds for example or station company river and their use in different contexts may reveal a lot about the plot structure of the novel so this is a very different form of study where you would understand what are the words that have been repeated what are the words what are their connectedness which word is connected to what what how did conrad frame his narrative whether the language that he uses is in concert with the other writers they were writing in that time so we can make a lot of different analysis in fact you can also study conrad's heart of darkness with other texts for example other important texts for example like lord james or the shadow lines and other texts that were written during that time and try to find out how conrad what uh, even his diary for example and then try to find out and match what are the type of differences that he makes when he is mythifying uh, congo in heart of darkness and is actually describing heart of darkness in his diary or in the letters that he writes to his uncle for example so the interconnectedness between the words such as curds station company river and they use in different context may reveal a lot about the plot structure of the novel the repeated lexical contrast between words such as mist haze light and darkness restraint and frenzy appearance and reality uh, they could shed light on the use of symbolism and impressionism in the novel so you can find uh, this was being repeated also in the other novelists of the time there are frequent references to dream nightmares phantoms apparitions and visions which suggest that marlowe in such trying circumstances find it difficult to keep in touch with the harsh reality so we have repeatedly said that uh, marlowe is defining almost the limits of narration between what is dream and between what is real and there is this continuous questioning uh, in the narrative about uh, the perspective of the narrator itself the more the corpus 
and the more the corpus that we deal with the more the text that we can deal with in such with such digital tools the more the corpus the more uh, we rely on software to do the work for example for example if we are to use these are just references these are links by which you can go to the science uh, for example if we are to use the complete works of conrad and the trace the relationship of certain words that recur in the text of conrad it will be extremely difficult if not impossible to do it manually such analysis often provides more detailed and descriptive links and connections that we as readers and even keen form critics can miss out critics however are often skeptic about such as you know the conventional critics and even critics are very skeptic about such statistical analysis of the text it's a very new form of study that is coming up and critics are still skeptic uh, but it is used uh, it is it is widely used in terms of interdisciplinary uh, study when you st study paintings when you study pyramids when there are innumerable sites where there are digital humanities projects uh, and not only digitization but they visualize text right so that is a very different form of understanding text so such analysis often provides more detailed and descriptive links and connections that we readers they just that the, the connections that we have we see that there are a lot of unimportant words here which we never felt that this could have been this could have been important in trying to understand uh, heart of darkness that no reputation conquered and all this word that find a place in this chart the most used words so you understand that uh, how they point out to very different perspectives critics however are often skeptic about such statistical analysis of text and can contribute in any way to literary interpretation so a lot of critics so you have two sides of this coin right there are some people who favor digital uh, humanities and there are some people some critics who would uh, who would not like digital humanities and who would not like interpretation of the text in this way however with time the scenario is improving and many textual scholars now rely on data mining data visualization techniques and use this techniques interpretation of a lot of text you have different articles coming up on conrad different articles are there very popular article for example one article by michael stubbs which which is, uh, talks about conrad in the computer examples of quantitative stylistic methods so it is up to uh, you people to decide uh, which is important and how you would adapt to both modes uh, see, see just see in the times of crisis we have uh, adapted to all the digital modes i am not familiar with the type of streaming that we are doing today but i have to adapt to it uh, in order to reach to you so we are continuously adapting and similarly literature as a subject is also continuously adapting to different techniques and we have to keep a very open mind to understand the, so this is just the last part of the interpretation i had kept it short because it is a very it goes on and it is quite complicated in that but it is a very different way of understanding conrad's yeah, it might hinder your interest in understanding conrad's heart of darkness so uh, i conclude my lecture and over to you shondi can you hear me yes yes uh, i can hear uh, thank you thank you so much sir for such an uh, insightful lecture and uh, uh, such an engaging lecture um, really and really uh, i think our students will be enriched by this uh, lecture uh, so uh, now i would like to uh, request shota das the faculty of our department to sum up the lecture Uh, and uh, if uh, students have any questions, uh, just to pass on to the uh, to, to our expert. So uh, please, Ashwatha, over to you. Our mic is off. Um, am I audible, sir? Yes. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, first of all, I, I would like to thank you very much uh, on the department's behalf uh, that you have uh, engaged with us uh, for some substantial amount of time and uh, uh, really provided us with such um, engaging information. And the fact that uh, digital humanities, uh, digital library, the physical and uh, the fact that you provided the contrast between uh, digital library and the physical library and how uh, digital humanities has enhanced our perspective overall, that it creates a link between the past and the present. Uh, it makes uh, literature a form of a pastiche uh, which yeah, and creates an interconnected coexistence that it takes uh, into account the visual culture as well. Um, it also raises the question uh, that if digital humanities adds to the circulatory function of the colonial discourses and um, that you mentioned uh, that Conrad was both the colonizer and the colonized, which would obviously mean that his text is also an extension of his own uh, consciousness. And a very interesting uh, fact that you put forward that uh, Heart of Darkness uh, plays uh, the extended role of presenting the intercolonial wars that were present at the point at that point of time. And um, I am sure the students would also agree with me uh, that uh, you ended uh, your presentation uh, with, uh, with the clip from Pulp Fiction uh, as at the end, uh, which is uh, since internet memes are, are today, they seem to signify an entirely different culture. So I am sure the students will have some uh, very interesting questions for you. Uh, and um, I would like to uh, convey them to you one by one. And yes. Um, so the first question is from Joyashri Shordar. And she asks, is the heart of darkness an indictment of white imperialism in the Congo of the time to which the book pertains? Yeah, I would yeah, like to, yeah. I, yeah, actually, what I've mentioned is that it, uh, Conrad was very, uh, Conrad's ideas about colonialism was of his time, right? And he was obviously uh, criticizing white imperialism. But then he was also distinguishing between good and bad imperialism, and he was trying to specifically uh, indict uh, French and Belgian imperialism. So he was making a difference in that. Uh, there is always this, in his work, we find that there is always this border between savagery and civilization. And that even when, if you uh, consider his country, he always thought that Russia was on the uh, more on the savagery side. So when he was colonized, his country was colonized, his ideas were... Uh, are very different. So it is a very, uh, it is an indictment of white, but it is a term that we have to use very carefully uh, because he is not particularly criticizing uh, British imperialism, but rather Belgian colonialism. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Um, there is another question. Um, yes, the next question is uh, from Ipshita Beige. She asks that in in the heart of darkness, what does Kurtz or Dr. Kurtz mean by his final words at the end of his writings when he writes, exterminate all the brutes? That is a question that will require another lecture. That, that has a lot of criticism on it. There are different views around it. But again, uh, Kurtz himself, uh, I had expressed here that Kurtz, when it, uh, there is always this fear among the colonialists as well as that you become you go the native way they use a word for it atavism that you have become like a native that uh, there are two different type of colonies that he's talking about right one is that people who fall in love with ivory Kurds had a lot of promise he went there as a missionary but then he fell prey to the native culture the native ideas the native ideology and became like them in a way and was subjected to the cruel savagery. So that was Conrad's impression was like his, uh, his motive and mission was different. But at the end of it, he became an absolutely different individual. So uh, you can interpret it this way as well. When you harm nature, and nature has a way to react. So in a sense, nature takes revenge on cuts. He has destroyed all the place. He has taken away the ivory. And then, and the comment that suggests that in spite of all the civilizing things that he talks about, uh, ultimately, this is the real cruel thing. That that was what the Belgians were doing. Exterminate all the brutes. 
that was how they were treating the thing in spite of all the type of pretensions that they were making leopold was making several claims with regard to the fact that they were uh, in a civilizing mission and that they were helping the blacks or they helping the africans see the light of civilization but those were false claims and that was what europe uh, was concerned with in a sense right thank you thank you very much sir um uh, there is another question from shoikot nath and he asks is the term ambivalent subject term used by homi bhaba applicable for the character of marlo the ambivalence is uh, in a sense here uh, marlo is always i have said marlo is always testing the limits of narration right and there is always ambivalent in the way it is being portrayed there's throughout in the text it, this is post modern uh, it echoes modernism it is in a sense post modern because the narrative questions itself uh, the uh, way he describes even the method of storytelling that it is surrounded by a haze that is described in the opening of the novel yet in a sense suggests that uh, but uh, on the one hand you can talk about the limits of narration and the way the marlo narrates it but again uh, he is choosing of marlo remember marlo is a very common english name right so he wanted to provide whatever certainty that he could provide by using the name of marlo it's an english name that he adapts to he is not writing in terms of joseph conrad he uses a particular english name adapts it so he is writing for the english so there is a certainty he gives a sort of certainty to marlo because in the beginning of the text you find that he is adapting a buddha like posture right uh, that gives him a sort of wisdom uh, that takes away in a sense a little bit of ambivalence but it is there in the narrative everywhere thank you very much sir um there is another question uh from rimpa mondol and uh, it's a different form of a question uh, why women are sidelined right of the bat in joseph conrad's heart of darkness none of the female characters even have names yeah absolutely to not only women but the blacks as well right that is what conrad has done in a sense this narrative is entirely about a masculine world this colonial world was related to a masculine world you can understand that patriarchy as a form was more bold actually uh, became more strong with this aspect of colonialism it was in a sense if you read homi bhaba as well he says that this element of patriarchy also reflected back to their own culture this culture of colonialism was enormously uh, actually uh, extremely patriarchal in that sense and even in conrad's narratives even in lord jim and even here uh, we hardly find any uh, properly developed black character or properly developed woman character and he is catering uh, to the exotic interest of the depiction of black although there are uh, even when other novelists like tober or other novelists were describing the black characters they were also either sentimentalizing or exoticizing a conrad leaves them out altogether uh, it it is as if a male and a very dangerous world to be in a habit so he takes a very different perspective on it we don't have any um, proper black characters or male uh, in a sense uh, female characters except for the mistress at the end very few references and uh, goods is intended right thank you um thank you very much um we have another question and can we have the next question yeah sure uh flashed on the screen please why women are right i'm uh, okay yes uh, uh, yes sir yes the next question is from ichita mitro Uh, though the intentions can be judged as good or bad she says but don't you think that the path of imperialism itself is hugely problematic for doing anything irrespective of good or bad yeah actually what i'm trying to say is that i'm talking about conrad's perspective when he's distinguishing between good and bad bad imperialism but imperialism in general is bad right it is what actually conrad sees in the beginning of the novels you destroy plunder and loot other places just because people have different complexion different uh, noses might be so that is what imperialism in general is extremely bad it it, it, it takes away the humanity of other people uh, it it 
hasn't gone away it take it has taken newer and very different forms it is more dangerous today why because during those times you know who was who was the colonizer and now you have multinational corporations ruling you and you don't have anybody to blame right so it is another danger from imperialism the domination still, still continues but it has taken on different colors yes sir uh, that is very true um the next question we have another question and can this be the last question i have a meeting after this please <laughs> yes sir i understand that yeah. sure yeah. we will make it the last question yeah, can we surely. have a last question flashed on the screen mm i think we are having some tech technical problem um, because of the storm today um is there any other question yes sir uh, we have another question uh, this this will be the last question um rimpa mondol asks what is the basic difference uh, between colonialism and imperialism she is mistaken uh, the spelling yeah i have mistaken the spelling and this is this is this is a you have a lot to say but i'll just say in brief imperialism more more or less deals more with uh, economic domination right uh, besides physical domination other things imperialism concerns itself with trade with profit and with economic domination right so in a sense even if historically colonialism might have ended in imperialism continues so when you are talking about imperialism it is for example if you are talking about imperialism in heart of darkness it is exploiting in terms of economic wealth as well and that is the main focus thank you very much sir uh, thank you very much for your uh, patient listening uh, and i am sure the students will be more than satisfied with the elaborate answers that you have provided and thank you very much uh, from my end sir thank you so much thank you for uh, thank you uluburiya college as well for providing me this opportunity to speak with the students as well as present my views and ideas about heart of darkness thank you thank you very much sir yeah uh, once again good evening sir and we uh, on good behalf of this department of english i would like to express my gratitude and heartfelt uh, gratitude and thankfulness to you for uh, we know very well that you are so very busy and still you manage to give us time and uh, we are pretty sure that our students uh, enjoyed your lecture you have uh, really really enlightened all of us uh, uh, with your uh, enlightening and uh, scholarly at the same time student friendly and very flexible lecture as well uh i uh, thank uh, uh dr devashish pal principal of ulubedia college uh, and pa chief patron of this web lecture series uh, for uh, being with us all the time uh, because he always remains with us in ev every single constructive endeavor that we used to uh, uh, take uh, undertake i thank uh, from the core of my heart i also uh, give my thanks to uh, professor shondip kumar dolu head of the department department of english uh, who made this uh, possible uh, who made this uh, grand endeavor possible he because uh, uh, from uh, throughout the uh, through the states he is just trying to communicate with the teachers and speakers resource persons and uh, we thank we are very much thankful to you sir for arranging such a uh, such a uh, the program for the students and for the entire college as well i would like to thank assistant professor of department of english abashu datta ghosh ma'am who is not present over here for uh, some problems but she is always she may not be physically present but she is uh, very much there with us uh, we thank you ma'am for being with us all the time i i, I thank all the teachers Uh, all the faculty members of this department of english of ulubedia college for working so hard and for staying together i thank all the students uh, for keeping patience and for being with us uh, and i am really sure that you have enjoyed a lot i thank uh, the entire college and all the faculty members of the college and to both teaching and non teaching staffs who are always there with us and who always uh, used to uh, 
help us to keep this uh, college a second home for us. So that's all for today, sir. As I was uh, saying in the very beginning that I wanted to meet you, but I didn't expect that in this way we would be able to meet you on this very virtual platform. We are hopeful that this Department of English of Puluveria College, once again, after this pandemic situation is over, we would be able to arrange another uh, seminar and there we would be able to uh, bring you once again in our college and uh, you would again be uh, delivering your enlightening lecture to us. So we will be waiting for that occasion. So thank you. Thank you so yeah. very much for being with us. Thank you, Devolina. Thank you, Sundi, uh, for inviting me. Uh, it was a delight, in, in a sense, to interact with the students as well. And thank you for the department. And hopefully in better days, yeah, uh, surely we look forward to future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.